Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I welcome all of you back to another Christian quickie reading. And this is sort of going to be a little bit of, well, definitely one of the longer videos I've ever had to actually make because this covers perhaps one of the most defining aspects of Chris's personality, his, uh, his person, his interests. There's a lot of things to discuss and we are going to spend virtually the rest of the night discussing them. So yeah, this I'm not going to lie when I say that there's going to be quite a lot of things to touch upon because the way this specifically affects Chris is almost in every aspect, possibly because, well, that's the thing we kind of have to like first get out the way is to recognize that not everything that is related to autism or related to Chris's autism, as it may be, 100% affects Chris's uh, decision making. And we'll have to come to some conclusions based on what we know and also based on the way Chris has decided to act despite what we know. So let's begin. <clears throat> now, the first thing it should be worth noting is that this uh, is that Chris actually went out of his way to incorporate a, a, a special ribbon uh, in saying, Quick Sonichu site is a proud supporter of autism awareness via autismsociety.com for more information. The ribbon logo is a TM of the Autism Society. Um, well, all I could say is that it's a good... F the, the first good thing I do like is the fact that Chris actually goes to uh, a slightly more respected uh, autistic charity than uh, someone like Autism Speaks. Yeah, I might literally do an entire expose about Autism Speaks because that entire, that, that entire charity is incredibly unhinged and has some very unhealthy ideas behind it. So, yeah, they're not... They're not, it's, they're not they're not great. Now, autism is the lens through which Chris experiences the world. It is impossible to understand Chris's defensiveness, hypersensitivity, narcissism, irresponsibility, paranoia, victimhood, self-pity, and poor grasp on reality without understanding his relationship with autism. Chris was diagnosed with a disorder in his early childhood, and it became a cornerstone of his identity and influence on how he would act alongside potentially other undiagnosed psychological or neurological disorders. Now, of course, this is how he plays this card, uh, certainly during the jail. Well, okay, that's not entirely, like, fair. I mean, by the time we actually get to talking about the entire jail saga and everything leading up to it is that... Um, well, well, we'll certainly get into this, like, when it when the time comes, because that regard, that, that's going to require more in-depth knowledge about the legal system than it does anything related to autism at, at this moment in time. Also, bear in mind, this, this little colourful character is Bionic the Hedgehog, and I fought for autism and I won. And it, it is the idea that he's conquering autism by confusing windmills with waterfalls. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the only unfortunate thing we're going to have to like... For, well, let's kind of actually start off with a, a little bit of this. Because the first big thing I really like need to um, illustrate before we like go any further is the idea is that... Why does Chris view the idea of autism as some something that has to be conquered? Because... I actually kind of want to talk in like z various points throughout this about because for those who don't know and I'm going to keep this extremely limited as possible because this is not about me <clears throat> is that I have I am on the spectrum myself I specifically have Asperger's syndrome but as far as I'm concerned and through uh, uh, medical knowledge is concerned and, and certainly through the records I've seen is that my diagnosis is on the very mild end of the spectrum. But the things I kind of need to emphasize is that mild or high functioning, it's sort of, it, it, the, the case needs to be made is that I have it. And well, it's just something I have to live with. And it's, the I think the, the issue I sort of ha have, and maybe the way that Chris perhaps sees it, is that Chris 
almost, at least in the beginning, you could say Chris was severely under the impression that if he didn't have autism, his life would be better. He could talk to girls, he would be smarter, he would do the things that he claims that, you know, he, he is incapable of doing because of his autism. However, for reasons I'm about to get into is that Chris, uh, autism is not a disease. It is a neurological condition, aka, just like myself, Chris is conditioned by what he has, and whether <clears throat> Chris fully wants to uh, admit it or not, is that it's entirely what he has, and it is entirely what he's going to have uh, as his brain continues to develop, and it's something that's been happening all throughout his life, and it was something that will continue all throughout my life. Now, what the first other major uh, aspect I need to like really make set in stone, ladies and gentlemen, is that the levels of severity for those who are on the spectrum ranges actually quite wildly. From people who need 24-hour care to those who are actually relatively independent, from those who kind of almost fall on a little bit of both ends of the spectrum. Because, and I, and I sympathize absolutely with these people, because there'll be some days where people think that they can actually conquer something, they can actually do something extremely unprecedented by displaying <clears throat> a certain level of independence and perhaps even doing something they never, they never thought they were capable of doing before. And then there are some days in which you feel like you just sort of don't have the strength to do anything, and you just would rather prefer a rest. Now, the thing I want to emphasize about this idea is that this is not necessarily related to autism, but it is also, in some ways, a, a, like almost like something of a manifestation of just saying, you know what, it doesn't have it doesn't have anything to do with autism. And for reasons again, I'll have to sort of like explain is that not everything Chris does is influenced because of his unique outlook on the world, and it's the same for many other people. Some people can literally go through their whole lives not really re realizing they had it or just sort of say, you know what, it is what it is and I don't necessarily uh, want anything different because, well, how could you experience anything different if you had it or not? So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing I want to say is that it's not that I, it's not that I don't understand the logic of why Chris would want to do this. But unfortunately, it does again set a, an unfortunate precedent that again I had to like iron out is that it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something that is going to, you know, shorten your lifespan. It's just, it's something that you have and it's something that you just makes you incredibly unique and special and different. So let's, let's go through this uh, one, uh, one step at a time. Because, let me tell you, there is a lot of things we need to go through. <clears throat> Overview. Pro tip. There is considerable debate on how to refer to the autism community, with some preferring diagnosis-based language, i.e. Chris has autism, adjectives, i.e. Chris is autistic, or nouns, Chris is an autistic. Since Chris never appeared to have a preference, the quickie uses these terms interchangeably. And again, to be honest, it's something I'm perfectly okay with and it's something that I wouldn't really blame you for saying if you wanted to call him this that or the other unlike uh the issues or the uh the, the way to explain things revolving around transgenderism because this is something that actually I have a lot of knowledge mostly through experience uh this is it's it's entirely fine so that's what it is that's one of the big things I do admit I like about autism, ladies and gentlemen, is that it is indiscriminate. You can't really discriminate uh, pe from people who have autism because it's not particularly in in the sort... Because, well, there are people who absolutely do use, you know, uh, autism as like a, an insult and Asperger's is the, for the same thing. But fortunately, I will say, ladies and gentlemen, is that, again... It's if if you if you do if you do find these sorts of things offensive, then you're more than free to do so. Also, because I think we live in that sort of age where even people who try to use it to insult people, it's not particularly a very 
good idea. I don't know why anybody would think they would want to use something like that or any other way to insult people just to get one over on someone. It's just, it's not, it's not a very nice thing. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Well, it's neurological condition, but again, it's depending on who, what you define it as. I'm just going to go with new. I'm just for the sake of brevity. I'm just going to do with what the quickie tells us. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder categorized by difficulty in communication and social interactions. Issues that usually surface in childhood and carry on throughout life is not treated early on. If not treated early on. The disorder represents a spectrum of different symptoms, behaviours, intellects and support needs. Autism can also lead to restrictive and repetitive behaviours, intense passions known as special interests, and unusual fixations or approaches to stimulation. No two people with autism are exactly the same. And many common autism traits can even contradict each other, i.e. no eye contact versus intense eye contact. I suppose if there's one thing I will possibly say maybe about this uh, one right here is that, and something that kind of where Chris falls into a little bit of this, is the idea that, well, Chris, I think, I imagine that Chris somewhere falls in the middle of this, but considering what we know of like his early dates in the uh, the late t uh, noughties, you could make the argument that Chris will do intense eye contact because he thinks he needs, you know, to garner somebody's attention. But it is also interesting that things like based on the attraction sign is that they almost seem to contradict, i.e. Chris wouldn't like it if somebody stared at him for prolonged periods of time. But yet he will do that, and among other things, to other females. So this isn't necessarily a, an, over, an overtly statement on autism, perhaps maybe from Chris's perspective, but just how Chris behaves, I suppose, is the way to put it. Autism is traditionally associated with either intellectual disability or above-average intelligence, or both in the case of savants. But most autistic people carry average intelligence. Yeah, I, again, that's that. It's the the range for this sort of thing varies deeply. And one thing I will make absolutely a case of before we even go any further than this: intelligence is not nearly the same thing as you know what's the word called? Oh yeah, things like common sense and actually putting into practice, you know, how intelligent you are, because. If you really want to prove how intelligent you are, then do something clever. But you know what? Do something clever with the uh, the foresight of knowing exactly what you're doing. And I, I think Alec Benson Leary best uh, said it when he said, you really should um, uh, come to a conclusion about what you're going to say before you actually... Uh, what? Ugh, it's, it's Okay, so he didn't quite word it like that. I think he worded it like... You really should have like a logical uh, reason for doing something before you actually do it. You can't just go on a limb and say, you know what, I did it because, you know, I, it felt good at the time. The autism spectrum uh, historically covered a number of related diagnoses, including Asperger's syndrome, which Chris resents but will get to. The DSM-5 replaced these diagnoses with a single diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, divided into three levels based on support needs. Due to his status as an internet celebrity and lol cow, it goes without saying that Chris has a, a very unusual case of autism. Since he is arguably the most documented autistic person in modern history, he affects public perceptions of the disorder on the internet. That being said, it is highly likely that Chris has many other issues beyond just having autism. And but yes, exactly, and something that also should be noted is that things like um, sociopathy and and uh, uh, psychopathy are not necessarily uh, byproducts of autism. They're not even the byproducts of things like schizophrenia or Down syndrome or among like or even Collins disease. There's so many things that actually. Um, that his narcissism it stems from the fact that Chris thinks he's perfect and he doesn't need to apologize for anything that's there you are that that's basically it that's where it all comes from 
Since Chris has demonstrated problems that, sim that can't simply be explained away by the disorder, for instance, it shouldn't have taken him six or seven years to learn how to speak, even with severe symptoms. Meanwhile, his severe delusions that spiralled later in life demonstrate signs of a schizoaffective disorder. Without a proper medical diagnosis, in part thanks to Chris's history of avoiding cooperation with people trying to help him understand for himself on that level, Autism remains the typical scapegoat to explain Chris's behaviour, even if the truth may be more complicated. Now, I suppose really at this point, I kind of also want to just uh, go into a little bit more detail because there's something I need to also really um, put into practice as well, is that in modern years, we see a lot more diagnoses of uh, people who have autism, and even people who aren't diagnosed necessarily and who may just be a little bit like shy or awkward and that's like a really big thing I kind of want people to like um understand and something they may want to take away with this video is the fact that being shy and being autistic are not one in the same sometimes they may be just a little bit different and whether you want to say as a matter of course that if like other characteristics uh, arise then that might just simply be it but are we also at that stage as well where kind of unfortunately a lot of people really do pick up on the idea that perhaps maybe people who have autism and people who are like are, are like there's, there's there's many characteristics in which we could like narrow it down but I think um the point I'm trying to get across is the idea is that as hard as it may sound, ladies and gentlemen, it's not particularly a good idea to immediately associate, like, attribute autism as being a de facto part of somebody's identity, if that makes sense. Like, it's not particularly a very good idea to immediately uh, see somebody you may recognize and say, he has autism, it's better to avoid him and literally let him go about his day no matter what, because it's not a good idea to interact with uh, somebody of that description. That's the sort of, like, stigmata that kind of, like, needs to be rubbed out because it's not a particularly very nice one. And it has... There's a lot of, like, deep-seated complications arising from it. In particular, the idea is that, well, how could you dislike somebody if you don't even know who they are? And which makes this even more strange in the aspects of Chris is because even if people were legitimately wanting to like you know reach out and support and I've reached out and people have even commented on my videos before about the fact that they've interacted with Chris several times in the past well that's the that's the part that I think the problem is is that it's not particularly in our it, it is it, it's not really in our interests for Chris to get help for for his sake Chris should be seeking help for his own sake because he's at that age really where you know this is this is the sort of thing that should have been addressed years ago but the jail saga makes it very very difficult for anyone to attribute anything you know nice to say about Chris whatsoever because well myself included no doubt agree the idea of that Chris is still pretty loathsome and the antics he gets up to are even to this day, are pretty shameless. And it's not particularly a good idea to even goat him into saying, Chris, you need just you just need to get off the internet because you've it's done nothing but ruin your life and not not in the least part by you, but also by, you know, other people who shan't be named. But Chris Tro Chris basically you make the choices for the choices you make and whether or not Chris is aware of it or not and this may be a really harsh thing to say, is that Chris can never really... There's only so far the idea that Chris doesn't know any better will take him, but it's something he will fall back on, including his areas of stress, which we will get to as well. Chris has built much of his identity around his high-functioning autism. His terror of being associated with severely autistic people causes him to be overly eager to prove his basic competence and cite his success in primary and secondary education, 
At the same time, his pride from accomplishing these things in spite of his disability has conditioned him to demand outrageous praise for his slightest efforts and infinite patience for his gravest errors. Moreover, Chris's belief that the entire Green County Board of Education continues to irrationally persecute him for his autism has left him suspicious of opposing points of view and resolute that anti-autistic prejudice is the reason for any of his setbacks. The angst he has over his unsatisfactory graduation is made manifest in his webcomic as one of his work's key villains. Chris not only seems to think that having autism imbues him with a special significance, but also feels that his autism is completely different from that of literally every other person in the world who has autism. Which, while not totally wrong, and yes, I will say that, that's not necessarily, he's not technically in the wrong about this, is a gross oversimplification of the disorder's special nature. Chris feels he is naturally better than everyone else and often talks down to people who display knowledge or experience of subjects he is unfamiliar with. During his conversation with Casey's father, Chris downplayed Casey's knowledge of biology and healthcare despite being proven wrong mere minutes before in a debate over the genetics of autism. At the same time, Chris believes he is not responsible for the majority of his own mistakes by being autistic, which is literally ridiculous on the very surface and it's something that I have never once used ever. Chris rationalises that it is wholly the fault of autism if he makes poor decisions. Now, outside of how just how ridiculous that sounds, let's also bear in mind is that it's a good scapegoat so that Chris doesn't actually have to say sorry for the things he's done wrong. Or if he does say sorry, he does it without having any prior knowledge as to what exactly he's doing because Chris secretly thinks deep down inside he's done nothing wrong anyway. Symptoms. Pro tip. Do not use Chris to bash all autistic people, and do not complain about how he gives autism a bad name. He is one person on the autism spectrum. This article mostly deals with Chris's autism. Yeah, that's like... I think people have more than acknowledged the idea that obviously Chris is only one person, and that's like far from the truth. I mean, there are still hundreds if not thousands of people with autism who are fantastic people that I've known personally and probably will get to know in the future and well one thing I will maybe slightly disagree on is that um it it, it it not helped is the fact that again it doesn't people people don't view autistic people as like attributing them as feeling as though they have some overly god overtly god complex but there are some people who just despise any people with any disability whatsoever so that's like again a little bit beyond chris's control a 2004 psychiatric evaluation confirms that chris has autistic disorder though his original childhood diagnosis papers are presumably lost forever chris was diagnosed by actual specialists not armchair psychologists Nevertheless, many trolls dispute the exact diagnosis of Chris's mental condition, on the basis that his absurd behaviour is inconsistent with that of various other autistics. Quick-related forms, and other forms for that matter, have seen numerous testimonials about people who are undeniably autistic, but nowhere near as fucked up as Chris has turned out to be. And in general, these forms do not consider Chris to be an example of what most autistics are like. They are well aware that the condition is a spectrum. Or condition, I suppose you could say. Quite often, autistics are indeed able to learn social skills to a certain extent in the context of intellectual learning. Others can learn social skills the old-fashioned way, usually through joining a group and coming out of their shell. Some can even come off as being completely neurotypical because they have to come to realise that they must adapt to others' expectations of what's acceptable if they wish to succeed in life. I don't really... I, I'm just going to say completely that maybe I sort of fit, like, 
Maybe in later parts of my life I've fallen into this category, but does... Do you think Chris has, like, at any point, do you think, really wanted to fall into this? I mean, he does make attempts to try and do it, but they don't go very far. But I might have an explanation for that later on. They may also adopt the alternative approach of haters gonna hate, surrounding themselves with like-minded people and not giving a fuck about the bullies. Chris, however demonstrates a willful ignorance of norm normalcy, with a sense of entitlement coupled with an expectation that others should not only understand his ridiculous idiosyncrasies, but also accept them at face value. Sometimes he even wishes to force them upon others. A layman might come to the conclusion that Chris is not autistic, and he's just a regular, albeit quite idiotic, guy with a few exocentricities and personality flaws. Or jump to the other extreme and conclude that Chris is completely mentally... the R-word, or full-blown schizophrenic. Some folks agree that Chris's autism is so mild that it's barely relevant, while others attribute his entire personality to it. Or the fact that all of Chris's other faults come through in shining glory, that it's just simple to believe the idea that Chris is, well, just a narcissistic asshole. But the truth appears to be somewhere in the middle. Chris's characteristics are most likely a combination of genuine autism, bad parenting, isolation, and other mental impairments. His symptoms are listed below, going to match the official DSM-5 diagnosis. A. Def def deficits in communication and social interaction. 1. Social emotional reciprocity. Chris struggles with social emotional reciprocity, the two-way understanding required for successful social interaction. Understanding others' intentions. Chris's difficulty gauging others' thoughts, feelings, ideas, and intentions. He doesn't always understand that these might be different than his own, or how to predict these behaviours. In an email between Clyde Cash and him, he sent Clyde a link to a video he made of himself destroying his PS3. He destroyed his PS3 under the egregiously mistaken impression that he'd be given $9,001 for it, which in itself is an indicator of his fundamental inability to gauge others, actual intents and future behaviours. Something Chris should have learned by this point because of how many times he'd been duped before. He filmed himself doing it specifically to prove to Clyde he wasn't present for the destruction, that it happened according to the video's objective portrayal. However, he added that if Clyde showed the video to anyone, Chris didn't mean to see it without paying him the money. It can be considered Clyde's word alone, possible movie editing and actors, and not a fact. Despite the fact that, well, we obviously knew it was Chris, and that kind of technology was, like, even for the camera you used, was just not... It, there, there's too many holes in, in this explanation. As though the video would have any less evidential weight on others if he denied to them what he rightfully claimed to Clyde, that it showed with enough uh, certitude that he would give him thousands of dollars because of its being shown. Chris places disproportional importance on literal statements. Chris acted as though he could convince others of a fact contrary to videographic evidence simply by stating it. Another example is virtually the entire Liquid Saga, where Chris honestly, fervently, pathetically tried to demonstrate what was already blatantly obvious to everyone, that his name is not Ian Brandon Anderson and that Liquid was not him. He seemed to believe strongly enough to become visibly frustrated that others might in some way believe Liquid's statements in the face of the obvious that he had to continually counteract those statements with his own as though just the statements were the most important or most effective means of proving what everyone already else knew. I mean, 
it stands to question about why Chris thought like his viewers were that stupid in thinking that despite the fact that Chris had been prevalent to Trolls' activities for two years at this point, why Chris didn't think that that was more than enough evidence and why he just decided not to leave Chris, Liquid Chris well enough alone. Or that matter, Liquid Chris probably would have just given up the shtick entirely because, well, he knew fine well that, like, Chris would just sort of get over it or, like, just try and admit defeat. But then again, it was not, it didn't quite end up that way either, which is bizarre. <laughs> Chris is also extremely gullible. While autistics can have problems with social cues such as sarcasm, thus being gullible at times, Chris is much more gullible than other autistics, let alone ones that are high functioning. This is more due to his inexperience. One need only see his extensive list of sweethearts to see just how easily fooled he is. In addition, not only has he been fooled by trolls on both sexes, presenting, pretending to be female sweethearts, he has fallen for trolls pretending to be Shigeru Miyamoto and approached him about making a Solitude game. A telling statement comes from the aforementioned email to Clyde, even if you upload the video yourself, it can be considered your word alone. Emphasis added. Chris might operate on the assumption that if a thing can be true, it's always reasonable to behave as though it is n to it is true no matter how slight the chance and no matter how more likely it is to be false. Empathy and Sympathy Chris shows very little empathy and concerns for others. In his plea to Clyde, his advice after the, su the, the S word of Clyde's brother, Ryan Cash, was find yourself a girlfriend. He asks for ED to please understand him because he is an innocent victim of misunderstanding. He wants empathy from others, but he can't return the favour. Chris primarily sees other people in terms of what they can provide for him. When accused of overstepping his bounds or other wrongdoings, he has no concept of remorse or apology, except as something he must do to continue receiving favours. When forced to apologise, he makes insincere apologies followed immediately by further demands. When Chris does attempt empathy, it's only when he already sees himself in the person, no matter how big the stretch is. This habit shows up in Chris's justifications for his votes. He voted for Obama because he was a victim of discrimination, equating Obama's struggle with racism to his own struggle with autistic persecution. No, Chris, that, that those two things are not nearly the same. He mainly voted for Hillary Clinton because she was a woman, which Chris was identified as since 2014. He never looked at either candidate's platforms or voted based on actual issues, just based on what he can see himself in. That's like... Why did we not think about this sort of thing sooner? <laughs> sort of thing. Again, I think this is the sort of thing they would almost call like Exhibit D. <laughs> social awareness and boundaries. So, Chris struggles with social approach. He believed that holding up a literal sign with his requirements for an eligible sweetheart was a socially acceptable way to meet people. He would pace around public places aimlessly, and he has difficulty initiating conversations. He sometimes starts off the convo with botched attempts at pickup lines and random access humour. Nowadays, much of his social approach takes the form of meet and greet photo ops at conventions, though he still somehow manages to screw that up. Chris doesn't end the concept of boundaries, whether physical or verbal. He kissed people he met seconds ago at too many games, he was quite handsy with Megan and Emily, and he buried his face in Catherine's breasts. He regularly refers to his superiors by their first name, sometimes even by pet names they don't even use. He doesn't seem to understand that different relationships call for different sets of social norms. Yes, absolutely, I sympathise. Even to people who are not, who don't have like the best of images as well, you need to learn to actually um, still respect theirs. Because they will, they will, 
people will communicate with others because of the context they actually have for each other. Whether you want to say that's an excuse to the way some people treat other people is debatable, but it's just sort of how the majority of times it happens in real life. Chris lacks a conversational filter. He calls this honesty. Normal people call it social dysfunction. Without provocation, he will tell you about his pink eye, his dirty cramped briefs, his autism, and now he is a virgin with rage. Only when his mother tried to tell him to knock it off did he actually give up telling everyone he was a virgin. He mostly takes interest in himself while talking, only occasionally taking interest in his conversational partner. All of the above could be explained by Chris's lack of social awareness. One notable instance of this, as revealed in the autism papers, was when two black ladies were speaking to Chris about his love quest, when Chris politely told them that they could not be his girlfriend because they were not white. Based on the report of the examiner, Chris believed he was merely informing the ladies as to his prerequisites for a potential sweetheart, while obvious to the fact he was being racially insensitive. And that's again something that Chris probably should have like... Now Chris, you could argue that all Chris was just trying to do was saying that, well Chris could easily say, I was just being honest. Well unfortunately again, we're just being completely honest with Chris as well, is that don't do that sort of thing because... Again, being racially insensitive is not a good look for anybody. Nobody wants to be associated with that sort of thing because it's one step away from just straight up saying that you hate black people. Sad but true, but that's again how people are going to see it. Chris may believe that he isn't and he'll just continue as he was by before, but again, that sort of logic doesn't exactly hold up to an angry mob who can see exactly the way it is. 2. Nonverbal Communication Chris can't show emotions well with facial expressions and body language. See his statement to the woman of the world if you enjoy Chris appearing in your dreams. Oh god, if you really want to know what this is, well, let, okay, I suppose, it, it, in fairness, it's literally just, um... Chris only accepts in-person female encounters, so... Just if you want to know what this the relevancy of this is, just let's let's just check it out. I wish to make a uh, general statement before I uh, assume with a comical wit. Granted, now I am still a single, legitimate, eligible male. I still look. I still am looking for an 18 to 27 year old, smoke-free, non-alcoholic, non-black woman. But most importantly, she's got to be caring, true, and honest. So, if there are any true, caring, honest women, not any trolls, that wish to uh, look me up and uh, schedule a date, you'll have to uh, find me in person. And that's going to have to be a chance meeting. In which, in that case, I would not be accepting any phone calls or emails. So, you'll just have to try to push your, you'll just have to push your luck on uh, getting a date with me. So that's just the way that is. So now, with that uh, note aside, uh, I wish to uh, c commute the uh, new comical wit, of which I have just created today. Oh, I am single and lonely, and possibly a bit horny, but that ain't fit for a droll situation. So now we'll just make okay. That's get corny. I'll laugh at you. Okay, I've, I've literally had enough of this. So, it's just from the sheer, like, there's no emotion in his voice. There's no, like, course for, like, any logic for anything he really says outside of trying to expand to himself and what he wants. Um, The fact that Chris just... I mean, it's... Despite the fact Chris has been doing, like, y making videos for YouTube for many, many years... Chris never really got into, like, the full logistics of how to actually broadcast himself, how to conduct himself while on camera. Basically, the sort of things that are paramount essentials before 
you even think about putting yourself on the internet. Because unfortunately, well, Chris has never really carried himself well on the internet. And, well, that's evidenced by nearly 17 years of nothing but failures. His inability to display emotions on his face has been called a dead fish expression, though Bob displays a similar stare. When he does attempt to have an expression, it looks very cartoonish, possibly because he copied it from actual cartoons. Also notice his inconsistent eye contact in his Sonic the Hedgehog watch and win sweepstakes news interview. He typically speaks in a monotone, and his attempts to sound expressive, see Quick's message for Ivy, come off as creepy and unnatural. And because I thought this was originally what they were going to be talking about, you know exact, you know what this is, I know what this is, yeah, let's just, again, this is Chris trying to, bear in mind, this is Chris trying to come across as sweet, but unfortunately, he's not, and good lord, this is from his, he had more subscribers than I did even as far back as 2009, what the hell? Hi, Ivy. I love you. Mm, I can't stop thinking about you. Mm. Anyway, I... For qualifications, I can say, Good morning. Wish you a happy day. Or I should go off to sleep, I could say, Good night. I'll be in your dreams. I love you. Oh, God. <sighs> Ivy, I love you, Ivy. Ivy, Ivy. At least you're not the poisonous kind. <laughs> Seriously, though, no, I love you, Ivy. I believe you all around. Keep a happy thought. Okay, so I know a lot of people have tried to suggest the idea that I gave off uh, Chris Chan vibes. Um, but unfortunately, this is kind of like debunked for several reasons. Because, again, if, if Chris's attempts at trying to come off as sweet, like, his intentions might have been good. But unfortunately, um, from the way the camera is, like, angled to the fact that there's this yellowish tint in what looks like a house that hasn't been lived in for years... To the fact that Chris looks disheveled, looks tired, the way he speaks, just... And also how, like, ex absurdly close to the camera he looks. You could immediately say that his attempts to look sweet make him look creepy. If for no other reason, then Chris legitimately does sometimes come across as creepy. Because most people who are actually in love do not go to this extent to say that... They, they love someone immediately just on just after knowing them for a couple of weeks, which was the true story regarding Ivy. And then just would do stuff like, again, the monotone, the dead eyes, it looks makes Chris look like a drug addict. If I could say, good night. Yeah, especially, I mean, guys, look, look, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm doing that. I'm going to do this. So watch this. Watch, I, I need to like, how creepy would it be, ladies and gentlemen, if all is to sleep, all is used to go to sleep, I could say, good night. Yeah, you know what I mean? That be, that That's creepy as fuck, and I wouldn't be surprised if people decided, okay, now I've got to, like, resize my, my entire uh, camera to, again to uh, get back to where it was. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if people wanted to literally run as far away from me after seeing something like that. So, and again, this is something because Ivy didn't know, because unlike because if as a because if Chris because any other person who w was not Ivy and saw that would have just run for the hills anyway. But because Ivy didn't in Chris's eyes, then therefore that just has to be love, I guess. Come across as creepy and unnatural. His incompetency with emotional display extends to his art and comics as well. He has a hard time displaying emotion on his characters' faces, and has even added emoticons to the speech bubbles to make up for his lack of ability to communicate through his art and writing alone. 
that's quite bad and it gets a little bit worse again. Chris also has very poor facial and vocal recognition skills. Julie was a 13 year old boy using an obvious uh, falesto and Chris fell for it. In one chat, the boy made no attempt to disguise his voice and Chris was none the wiser, disclosing personal sexual details. Two images of different people were used to represent Blanca Weiss and Chris didn't even notice that either. In a name chat with Vanessa Hudgens, she sent him a link to pictures of Megan Fox and Chris complimented her on them, even though the two didn't have the same skin colour. He didn't realise that Emily and Kim Wilson were the same person, even though their voices and laughs were obviously identical. Chris is inconsistent with his self-portraits and drawings of other people, relying more on colour schemes and cosmetics, hair, clothing choices, etc. Then on facial features to distinguish them apart in his attempt at a political cartoon. He relies on labels and arrows to distinguish the characters instead of exaggerating their facial features like mainstream political cartoonists. He also depicts Obama in a traditional African cap he seldom wears. Hmm. It's interesting as well. Yeah, okay, well, well, let's just get past Obama for one second. Three, interpersonal relationships. Chris's social dysfunction has caused him trouble with developing and maintaining relationships, platonic or romantic. Many non-autistics have the same problem, but Chris is particularly inept at socialising. Chris's earliest friend, Sarah Hammer, was more of a bully than a friend. She locked him in the crawl space of her house, his high school gal pals were hired help, Bob and the principal arranged a deal where they were paid to hang out with Chris, he rarely hung out with them outside of school hours except on his 18th birthday and at the prom. Chris has had very few friends as an adult. He loses friends regularly, manages to get banned from his favourite hangouts and has no contact with any of his beloved high school gal pals. He did not have a circle of adult friends who played Pokemon with him for example. But he lost contact with them once he switched his focus to imaginary friends. Presumably... It was the only way could Chris, Chris could form like any sort of society for himself because as luck would have it, uh, Chris's uh, behavior behaviors both inside and outside of the, his actual boundaries was stuff that people were never really going to fall back on. For example, the stuff regarding Chris's narcissism is the sort of thing that would discourage people largely from being friends with them as well as Chris's inability to actually socialize on a way that doesn't always revolve around himself. Despite this, however, Chris's social life was robust in comparison with his love life. Chris is in his 40s and he hasn't had a serious romantic relationship or any consular contact with the opposite sex, aside from a prostitute and his own mother. Though whether the latter was completely consensual remains questionable. Yeah, I've been over that before, but I'm still under the impression that Chris was being more genuine when he said his mother asked him to stop, or the same sex for that matter. His foray into online dating was a failure, and every one of his sweethearts was either just a friend or a troll. He viewed his desperate search as a love quest, a saga that began on his 21st birthday and only ended when he got into a polyamorous marriage with his OCs. Chris is also estranged from his family outside his parents. Chris's half-brother Cole Smithy has blocked him on social media. He has little contact with his own other half-brother David, and knows even less of his half-sister Carol. As with many autistics, Chris does not manage to have a good relationship, does manage to have good relationships with animals, whether real or fake. Animals are more direct and don't have as complex of social rituals as humans. Animals also serve as a social lubricant for people on the spectrum. Anyone who knows anything about Temple Grandin can back this up. I don't really know who Temple Grandin is, but I'll, I'll take their word on it. Chris's Restricted and Repetitive Behaviours 
To receive an autism diagnosis, the DSM-5 requires restricted and repetitive behaviours in at least two of the following four categories. Chris meets all of them. Examples are given below. Movements and speech. Chris often exhibits echolia, which means he constantly repeats phrases from his favourite television shows, movies and video games, regardless of whether they fit the current situation. So, wait a minute, if they do fit the current situation, does that mean they're fine? I'm genuinely curious because I don't quite know. I think, I, I think they do, but... In some instances, he calls this humour. He tends to use a so, uh, uh, neo uh, neo neologisms, that is, he creates new words that only he himself understands and expects other people to comprehend them. That sounds like blatant lunacy, but yeah, it is absolutely true for Chris. He uses the same terms and exact phrases frequently. Many articles on this very wiki have been written to explain the resulting quickisms. Autism is also linked to speech impediments. Chris has trouble with articulation and often slurs words together like Encyclopedia well Encyclopedia Dramatica and Christian Western Chandler. He frequently stutters, clutters his words, and speaks in a higher pitched register. Chris's unusual mannerisms are another sign. He rocks back and forth, dubbed the autistic shuffle, especially when stressed. He uses the same gestures repeatedly, such as his stress sigh, the claw of fail, and the infamous dramatic glasses removal. He feels the need to refer to people by their full names, plainly visible when he talks about himself, Clyde Cash, or Adam Stackhouse. An overlooked but crucial characteristic affecting all of Chris's physical activity is his display of hypotonia, which refers to a distinct lack of muscle tone, in biological terms referring to tension rather than the colloquial use to describe muscle strength, although raw physical strength is also affected by it, which affects motor skills as well as his stamina. Chris is not only very clumsy, he shows abnormally low muscle strength and gets tired quickly, even by simply shuffling around for a couple of minutes, which cannot be entirely explained by his lack of physical exercise. Whenever Chris is shown sitting, he is spread around like a rag doll, hanging limply, as his muscles cannot support his entire body properly. 2. Insistence on sameness one of the biggest symptoms of autism uh, Chris displays is his fear and resistance to change. Well, beyond the point that it could be even related to his autism. Chris is reluctant to get or even look for a job as he has only worked four months in his entire life. Just to give you guys some uh, references right here, ladies and gentlemen, is that I've worked... Count it, well, full-time or otherwise, those sorts of things included, for the last three and three-quarter years. So, and that's like a full, and on a full-time basis as well. That's not included everything I did uh, prior to the middle of 2020. Has never come close to moving out, has had a very hard time selling or giving up his toys or shirts, wouldn't stick to a diet and exercise program, doesn't try new ways to attract women, and has a very hard time coping with his banishment from the game place, where he used frequently to spend his Fridays. This might be resistant to change of his old lifestyle, or just going to school and coming home and playing video games. His proven tendency to avoid responsibilities and self-improvement show that he is trying to remain a child or simply fears failure of all types. So, the logic is, why bother at any one of them when you can fail at any one of them? Chris thinks in absolutes, and in terms of clearly defined steps in order to do something. He thinks there must be sex on or by the third date. He describes his sadness in terms of his heart level and briefly mentioned a scale of respect. He feels that if he knows uh, he the correct steps to getting his sweetheart, he will be able to find one easily. 
His crash course in dating and suggestions to Blanca assume that a relationship should follow a rigidly predetermined progression instead of a natural flow. In an exchange of emails with Jackie, Chris responded to her frank descriptions of his habits and lifestyle by saying she had exceeded the hurtful truth level. While he knows he should be appreciative of hearing the truth about himself. This was the only way he could wrap his brain around the abstract idea to be able to tell her that he thought she'd gone too far. Some autistic people follow rules so strictly that it's bordering on OCD. Chris, however, has the opposite problem. He lives in a filthy, unorganized house, makes comics with a very inconsistent plot, wears the same shirts for days at a time, and disobeys the law when it inconveniences him. So, yeah, whether, again, I don't necessarily understand, like, again, probably down to a lack of funds and whether or not Chris really did believe he could earn more through his monthly tugboat than actually getting a job is all relevant, I suppose. But did Chris ever, like, stop to think that maybe at any point his parents could have possibly been wrong about any of these and I've had some uh, doubts in my mind about whether Chris really thinks his parents are in the right about everything. Because clearly, if, if, if everything was right, then why would Chris really think for one second about going after his mother the way he did? 3. Fixations and Special Interests Chris has an extremely narrow range of interests. He seems to only give a damn about video games, cartoons prowling for his next sweetheart, his initials, and Sonichu. So much to the point where he practically places himself somewhere in everything he creates. He often wishes to combine two interests. Unnatural relationships with inanimate objects are also a sign of autism. Chris has evident obsessions with his medallion, his PlayStation 3, and any number of other items that clutter up his room. Since autistics have difficulty maintaining relationships with people, they often end up becoming emotionally dependent on objects, though this symptom is seen much more in autistic children. Although he does not demonstrate any, compete compa um, any competency with them, Chris has a fixation on numbers and statistics that would genuinely be irrelevant to others. He describes measures in concrete terms, e.g., five miles from the city instead of outside the city. Well, that might also be related to Chris's um, um, unreliance to actually conform to uh, more generic and standard versions of English, and has a particular obsession with times and dates, time stamping nearly every scene in the comic and giving his characters birthdays and middle names that have no relevancy to the plot unless it becomes convenient to age up the characters. Needless to say, Chris's tendency to blurt out exact dates and times, assuming he's not talking out of his ass, has made the job of the quickie chronolog chronologists much easier. On the other hand, his haphazard treatment of dates and times in the comic has led to countless continuity errors. Chris's fixations also manifest as brand loyalty. Chris has been loyal to Nintendo, Sega, and Sony. To the exclusion of Microsoft, his, he, is, he is loyal to McDonald's and dislikes Burger King. He felt that Harry Potter was somehow a threat to Pokemon. His brand loyalty went beyond simple preferences and extended to actual obsessions and hatreds. He'd, he'd, up, he'd hype up Axe at Walmart in videos. He blindly trusts advertisements and even include ads in his own comics. Chris's transgender identity is yet another fixation. According to psychologist Ken Zucker, trans folks are more likely to be autistic than the general population. I don't know if that's literally based on anything and I would like to see some evidence to this, but even if it is, I'm not entirely sure why, but there you are. The link is caused by, among other traits, autistic's tendency to fixate on issues, in this case gender. Many autistic males, including Chris, also have qualities that can be considered girly, such as passiveness, since they have less social awareness. 
They may behave in ways that may be considered atypical for either sex and display less regard for gender roles. Chris and many other autistics perceive their quirks as being female in a male body, or vice versa, and assume that they will fit in better as their desired sex. His, ex his fixation showed itself strongly when Sega changed Sonic's arms from tan to blue. Chris launched a crusade that ended with him macing an innocent GameStop employee. A criminal offence launched entirely by a mirror cha minor change to a fictional character who happens to be Chris's icon. Yeah, that's like... I know, again, if we ever get to talk about that, uh, that mass shooter who was obsessed with the character Amber from Danny Phantom might be another, like, level entirely, but I don't think Chris would ever, like, go to that extent. 4. Sensory Processing Autism affects how the brain interprets the senses. Chris is often either hypo or hypersensitive to sensory stimulation. Chris often wears his accessories and medallions over top of his clothing to avoid skin contact with metals and plastics. This is evident in the way in which Chris wears his watch over the cuff of his sleeve and wraps his medallion through the collar of his shirt. Most obvious, however, is his wrist warmer, which he places on the chain of his medallion. Chris has stated that it is a part of my necklace. It's a Wilson wrist warmer I used to cover the discomfort of the number of links back there. Loud sounds also bother Chris. I mean... So do I, but that's just, yeah. He skipped pre pep rallies in high school and has expressed hesitation about visiting bars because of the noise. Sensory dysfunction isn't limited to the five external senses. It extends to internal, hidden senses such as balance, body position, hunger, first time, gag reflex, and internal body pressure, such as the one when he has when he has to use the, fa the facilities. Severity of Chris's Autism Informally, autism may be subdivided into separate classifications based on the intelligence and degree of function the autistic individual possesses. For a general idea, this crude scale could have levels of high functioning, medium functioning, and low functioning. Chris has latched onto this concept and will frequently qu qu qualify his condition saying he has high-functioning autism, or HFA. Generally, HFA is loosely defined as the ability to live in the mainstream world as opposed to being institutionalized. Having near-normal comprehension, demonstrating fluent speech, and possessing average or above-average intellect. This presents Christian with an easy scapegoat and alibi. He cannot be blamed for his own failures because he has autism but he does not accept treatment or advice for his medium or low level autistic traits because he's high functioning and therefore nearly normal. Mind you why Chris thinks, you know, normal people think they're exempt from the ideas of, you know, um, taking responsibility is something nobody will ever be able to find out outside from the reasons people have come up with. <laughs> Trolls have often noted that the high-functioning qualifier is not a clinical diagnosis and is not recognised by the DSM-IVTR or the ICD-10. This usually goes hand-in-hand hand with questioning the severity and or diagnosis of Chris's impairment, if not outright calling him a liar. However, the Chandlers didn't make the HFA label up, and compared to kids who could barely speak, and just walk in circles all day. Chris is relatively close to neurotypical. Semantics aside, though, it's clear that Chris is far from normally functioning. Only an updated psychological profile would really provide insight into the complex and controversial mixture of autism and mental illnesses slash disorders that is present within Christian. The newer DSM-5 does distinguish different levels of severity based on the amount of support needed. But the new term is Autism Spectrum Disorder Level 1, not High Functioning Autism. 
Additionally, the autism community detests functioning labels since they oversimplify the spectrum as a one-dimensional scale. Now, this is something I am absolutely in align with because to even understand the aspects of autism, it's not something that could just be summed up in one word or two words. It goes far deeper and it's after effects completely ir ir ineradicable from what uh, people sometimes un uh, fail to understand. But one thing that stands in line with Chris is that whether or not this is just... does it If it means the same, then why does Chris prefer the term high-functioning? Just because he's used to that for so long, I'm not entirely sure. Additionally, the autism community... Okay, when describing whether or not someone can speak, the community prefers verbal and non-verbal instead of high or low functioning. Disgustingly, however, uh, per but perhaps not surprisingly, Chris detests low-functioning autistics in the exact manner that he fears normal people will detest him. So, making Chris a hypocrite in, every, in that sense... In Mailbag 25, he compares that those with low functioning autism with those who suffer from severe retardation or severe brain damage, thinking that they would have their arms linked together, have deformities, be confined to wheelchairs or crutches, and drool and grunt and growl, as though they had literally just come off the effects of a uh, of a lobotomy. He also has he has also described them in extremely cruel and derisive terms calling them windows to hell, and compared them to zombies. Okay, few things again are, no are quite need to be noted here. One, if Chris wanted to see actual zombies, go to Philadelphia. I heard that uh, their pentable addictions are sort of reducing the entire city into something resembling a, a scene from The Waking Dead. Second, are you really trying to tell me that... Well, this is what, the reason why so many people like have issues with Chris in all sorts of communities. Because even if Chris is trying to be honest about what he thinks, the way he speaks about these people who... He acts as though these people have chosen to be like this on purpose. And bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I've known plenty of people who, like me, have autism and Asperger's alike... Some of them have actually had very, very successful lives. Some of them, not so much. And some of them are horribly crippled socially and physically because of their condition. And all Chris can think to say... It would be interesting, however, to see whether Chris's opinions about this has changed. However, I'm not even sure if it's even worth pressing the question. Because I don't even think it's worth pending Chris for a response. Because... If Chris did have any aspects of changing, then he would have just come out with this. Similar in the same way when he comes out with things when he just wants to be accepted. In society. Not just by those he wants to try and impress. It shouldn't be Chris would ever try to have to impress me or impress people who are very severely affected. But I think we know that's... I don't even think people who are on the most extreme cases of autism would actually accept Chris. I think their I think their society is far more uh, like above the standard of people like Chris. The irony of this resentment towards low functioning autistic people is that he has a severely autistic cousin. As Well, yeah, exactly, as revealed in the autism papers. This probably means that either Chris is not aware of his own relatives, very probable, or he has disowned members of his own family on the basis of them having the same medical condition that he has, albeit more severely affected by it, being the autism Nazi that he is. He explains that he refuses to date a girl with any form of autism because he fears that seeing them will make him think about what he might be like if he had anything other than high-functioning autism. Too late for that. Chris believes he could do much more than any low-functioning autistic ever could, even as he lived with his own mother well into his 30s. 
has never had a real girlfriend or held a steady job, and soils his pants on a semi-regular basis. What a guy. <laughs> Still presuming Chris is autistic, he is high-functioning since he can talk, drive, write, and draw, even if he's not the best at any of these things. However, this also means that he has the same medical condition as Elon Musk, Temple Grandin, and Satoshi de Tajiri, amongst many others. Yet he has failed to do anything significant with his adult life, hence proving that his vulgarity and failure are, for the most part, this is further elaborated down below, his own fault. And yes, that is, I can absolutely stand by that 100%. But what's most hypocritical of all is that Chris himself allegedly stopped speaking at the age of one and didn't speak again until he was seven. This is a major language delay and he would only have been considered low functioning at the time. This is especially relevant since Chris was diagnosed in the 80s and HFA in Asperger's was only recognised in the English speaking world in the 1990s. At the time of his diagnosis, being autistic required at least a delay in speech acquisition, if not complete muteness. And it, once again, ladies and gentlemen, we sort of run into a situation where, even if you were to give Chris like the benefit of the doubt in some aspects of his life, not all of them, but I will say is that this is one of those occasions, again, ladies and gentlemen, where, you know what, what motivated Chris to say, you know, he r r looked upon severely disabled people as windows to hell? What motive really was there for Chris to say this? Was it just so that he wanted to emphasize why he would never date autistic people? I think what Chris uh, seems to uh, forget f quite frequently is that he seems to be under the impression that that's the, the only aspect that actually matters in a relationship. I would not have an issue with dating people who are autistic. You know why? Because guess what? There are more pressing things about a person than just having autism. And there are much more important things in people's lives, you know what, even going through dating that don't revolve around autism. I wish I knew uh, the correct words to say for this, but it seems very bizarre that the fact that, again, if Chris wasn't going to give people an inch, then, well, you know what, one thing that Chris could actually do is just straight up, why is it, again, Chris's standards for, like, dating and, like, functioning in society are so exponentially high and demanding, and yet this is sort of where he draws the line. I don't quite understand, and also... I think if Chris is, well, Chris, this is one of those things where Chris has absolutely been adamant on sticking to his rule, and, well, that alone would make him look like a dick in front of many, many women anyway, but anytime Chris did go on a date, he managed to screw it up himself because I think he just thought he could get away with some things, because, again, uh, that date he once went in 2009 where he just straight up got hands-on with people uh, was just something that Chris shouldn't find well. If you are, if you reach the age of 27 and you don't know better than not to just touch people inappropriately when you're out with them, if you generally do not know that by that point in your life, then something really, really strange is, must be going on. Onset and diagnosis of Chris's autism. No one gives a shit that you are autistic. They never did. Jackie telling Chris something he will flat out ignore because he doesn't seem to think that that can be true. S Chris's version of how he developed autism is best explained in the Song of Christian video. There he explained how a babysitter locked him in a room filled with toys at around the age of one and one of one and a half. After crying for hours, he emerged from the room unable to talk. As Chris himself puts it, God put the mute button on me and implies that Chris could talk before this incident, which directly contradicts Chris's own parents stating that he never spoke until around the age of seven. Most specialists claim that these symptoms of autism began to show around that age anyway, so even if the events of the story happened, the babysitter didn't cause the autism. Well, of course, that's just impossible. It is far more likely that Chris's parents simply looked 
looked for anyone to blame for Chris's sudden loss of language. Development. Even a random babysitter. Notably, Chris even has even diverged from this story before, having claimed at least once that he was intentionally injected with autism by doctors. That's bullshit. When he was a child, as if that was even possible. I suppose the only <clears throat> explanation to this is that Chris was still under the illusion that Chris was given some sort of shot of some description and there was some like correspondence he made in his mind towards uh, a lot of Japanese children during the 80s who were, who, who were emerging with autism. But again, that's not like linked to anything related to, you know, vaccinations of anything of the sort anyway. So that that can't really be true either. Nevertheless, it speaks volumes of the veracity of the former account if he can't keep his story straight. Not to mention that Chris probably has little idea on the causes of autism anyway. As far as Chris actually becoming autistic, studies have shown that there is a positive correlation between the age of the mother and the risk of autism. Given that Barb was 40 years old when she gave birth to Chris, this is the likelier explanation. It is also worth noting that Bob was an engineer, and studies have found higher autism rates among children of engineers and other technical occupations. Bob's grandfather, Savannah, is also autistic. <clears throat> it is currently unclear how Chris came to be considered as autistic. Although Chris has claimed that his parents possesses official documents uh, about this that is in a safe, when pressed to release this information, he provided a 2004 psychiatric evaluation that states that Christian was diagnosed with autism when he was around age 5 or 6. However, there's no way to be sure if the evaluator simply wrote down Chris's responses to his questions or independently verified them. <clears throat> For example, Chris might not remember his exact age when he was diagnosed, but you think his medical records could be more precise than 5 or 6. By the time of the Chandler's legal battle with Green County, Chris's autism seemed to have become a universally accepted fact, but the details of how, when and where Chris was diagnosed remains a mystery. When recounting his childhood, Chris usually skips straight from the evil babysitter incident to age 7 so we know very little about what, if any, treatment he received during his crucial period of development. In a Wikipedia mailbag, Chris claims that when he was young, his parents were told he would never be able to read, write, or function on a normal level. He and his doctors have now upgraded his condition to high functioning, but apparently his incredibly abysmal upbringing has actually allowed it to progress to mid-functioning at best. In his Song of Christian video, he explains that uh, his mother took him to the toy department at, and coaxed him to read aloud the names of GoBots and later Transformers. Chris says he began speaking when he was seven, that is, in 1989. When the Transformers line was on its last legs and the GoBots line had long since vanished. This would seem to indicate that this form of therapy has ha had to have gone on for several years before producing any results. Persecution Chris attended Green County Primary School, apparently without incident, from age 5 until age 9. Problems arose for him in the 4th grade at Nathaniel Green Elementary School where he alleges that the faculty wanted to remove him from the mainstream classrooms and send him to what he calls an institution. He also claims that the teachers at the school held him down and recorded his screams. Chris frequently cites that this as evidence that the school was senselessly cruel towards him for no reason apparent to him except an innate fear and distrust of autistic people. More probable, given Chris's ongoing behavioural issues, is that he threw a temper tantrum so big it forced the faculty to physically restrain him while refusing to restrain himself. There's no way to know if Green Elementary treated Chris unfairly, but the incident does suspiciously resemble Chris's arrest in July of 2005. 
The Chandlers sue to prevent the school board from removing Chris from mainstream education before ultimately relocating to Chesterfield County to continue Chris's mainstreaming education from there. Chris is frequently brings up that the reason people used to be cruel to him in his childhood was because they did not understand autism. In the 1980s, when autism had been known for around 40 years, when asked about why they did not understand, Chris delivers his kind response of, I do not know. There's no way to know how much of Chris's attitude about the Green County uh, crisis is based on his personal recollections of w or what he was later told by his parents, who themselves seem unusually paranoid about the country's vendetta against their family. However, the result of the incident is clear. Chris emerged from adolescence firmly believing that many people not only misunderstand autistic people, but hate and fear them. He seems to believe this prejudice is based not on a person's actions, e.g. throwing fits and irrationally screaming, but on a person's mere identification as autistic. Regardless of function, given Chris's fear of low-functioning autistics, he may in fact think this prejudice is perfectly justified, but wrongfully targeted at a high-functioning individual. Of course, in Chris's mind, he may as well be the only high-functioning autistic in the universe. So he is the one and only innocent victim in everyone's favourite game of Kick the Autistic. Chris's tactful and sensitive comments on a news story about a woman with Asperger's syndrome being raped revealed that he believes the media, like the rest of the world, has a bias against autism similar to missing white woman syndrome, and that the story wouldn't have been reported if the victim was a woman with proper autism. What an absolute well, that is that is a t what an absolute terrible thing to say. For shame, Chris, for saying something like that. Jesus Christ. Chris's misconceptions about autism. It's not clear that Chris has any understanding of what precisely autism is, except that a he has it, b it's a bad thing, and c. He's a brave little boy for living with it. His song, Autism, sums up his attitudes about the disorder. A-U-T-I-S-M, what does it mean? Silence and friends unseen, a few brains as well. That is autism, and that makes us seem special to you. Chris attempting to spell out autism in more ways than one. Hmm... I would say as far as, like, a general attitude goes, I think Chris has worse viewings than this, but we'll get to those in a second. To Chris, that's all it is. A condition that makes you a bit smarter than normal human beings and mysteriously makes people not want to be your friend. Chris also seems to only be aware of the symptoms of autism that fit in with his odd pseudo-bohemian lifestyle. Asexuality is very common in autistic people. This is because any form of romance or sex may be too intimate for an autistic mind to cope with. This is completely contradicts Chris's love quest and suggests that he is actually trying to compensate for his inability to feel truly sexually attraction. Even if that means becoming a genuinely disturbing pervert. His tone deafness for singing is fairly unusual for an autistic individual as well. Autistic people tend to have stronger pitch perception, and they are more likely to have perfect pitch than the general population. I suppose one way to describe this is that Chris just sort of sometimes comes across as so dead and his words have so little weight because he lacks any semblance of like fire in his belly. To make his, his point any worth describing except in the form of rage. Chris considers himself to have helped cultivate the first generation of autistic people. How humble of him, suggesting that he believes he is a prevalent figure in the autistic community. Well, people know of Chris, it doesn't mean they say they want to know Chris. <laughs> and by the way as well, Chris, this is Chris's personification of autism for beating up in Super Smash Bros. Dear me. 
Chris considers, okay, um, in a May 2010 video, he stated that our society is spending so much time on the internet that everyone is becoming autistic. This further proves that people with little to no social contact shouldn't attempt social commentary. Uh-huh. That, and, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, there's not much I can add to that. Nat and Chris has no fucking clue what his own disorder is actually like. In November of 2010, he tried to use this excuse to guilt trip Jackie into being sorry for yelling at him, which worked as well as you'd expect. Chris's failure to understand the symptoms of autism may well explain some of his odd behaviours. Due to lack of social activity and poor theory of mind, Chris doesn't seem to realise that his behaviours are what they are, as best demonstrated by his belief that, is, that it is normal for an adult to shit themselves. Chris does not recognise the differences between himself and others, and this applies to the differences between himself and neurotypicals. And seeing no differences, he believes his autism to have been thoroughly conquered, even though while embodying every single trait of it. <laughs> Coupled together with Chris's experience or whatever they are in the real world, and you get, well, the, poor, the person Chris inevitably became. Chris on the causes of autism. There's a broad scientific consensus that autism largely arises from genetic factors. Chris's own case is consistent with the theory that children born to older parents are at greater risk of developing autism. Bob and Barb are, were 54 and 40 respectively when Chris was conceived. Chris's own uh, expressed views on the root causes of autism are all over the map. He's espoused a few different theories at different times and in different situations. His oldest theory, dating back to the Song of Christian in the late 1990s, is that the abusive babysitter was responsible for his condition. In his arguments with Cly Cash in early 2009, he said that, scientifically speaking, autism has possibly come from a drug or otherwise it may possibly be genetic and that the babysitter incident merely brought out the uh, curse that was buried within me. When explaining his condition to Matt DeVoria late in the fall of 2009, Chris insisted that autism has no genetic factors. In that instance, however, he had an obvious agenda. He hoped to convince Matt that any children he fathered with Matt's daughter Casey wouldn't wind up inheriting his condition. Because of this, it's difficult to say exactly how sincere he happened to be at that moment. To muddle this issue even further, in Mailback 12, Chris blamed the cause of autism on a shot the doctors optionally give to their child after birth. Apparently, in reference to the highly disturbed urban myth alleging that childhood vaccinations lead to autism, it's not likely that Chris even has much of an awareness of the facts and assertions of said myth and was probably looking for a throwaway excuse to deny any hereditary factors. In a video in 2010, Chris said the internet made people autistic, likely confusing the hyperbolic claim made jokingly to the effect with that effect with fact. Ironically, Chris's excessive use of internet in place of human interaction has probably done more to exasperate his systems than almost anything else. In his autism tutorial from early 2011, Chris slewed back toward a more mainstream view, discussing the genetic factors behind autism and complaining about how his parents conceived him late in life. He also, however, warned viewers that smoking, drinking or exposure to car exhaust could cause dangerous genetic damage that might result in autistic children. And for reasons I kind of explained... Uh, and probably will bring up again at a later date, it's very strange that, well, outside of possible miscarriages, the idea that Chris seems to think that, you know, why anybody would go to that extent to do those sorts of things anyway is just, like, we're go it's like we're, we're beyond the looking glass for cases like that. Now, but then, of course, be speaking of completely over the hill... Chris versus Asperger's Syndrome 
Chris is easily outraged by any attempt to associate or confuse autism, high functioning or otherwise, with Asperger's syndrome, a similar condition now considered by many experts to overlap with HFA on the autism spectrum. In fact, Asperger's syndrome was eliminated and replaced with Autism Spectrum Disorder Level 1. In the new DSMV, making both the condition and high functioning autism one and the same, at times, Chris has stated that he dislikes Asperger's syndrome because sufferers of the disorder supposedly steal sympathy away from autism awareness. You know what, I usually consider myself to be a very empathetic man, but once again, this is not the first time I've heard this from Chris, and this isn't the first time I'll just straight up say, Chris, what on earth are you talking about? He has also claimed that the name is too close to Asperger or Asburger for his taste. Well, for his taste, for Chris, yes, absolutely. But again, what about any, anybody else, Chris, who might have a different opinion? In the early days of the Wikipedia mailbag, Chris, asking Chris about Asperger syndrome was the most effective way to troll him. This culminated in the creation of Aspergue. In the present, Chris simply hates Asper Asperger's Syndrome because it reminds of him how angry he got the last time someone brought it up. Uh, that's a petty and bullshit answer. In other words, a completely unjustifiable opinion. Chris has declared himself close-minded on the subject. Not the first time, and even to this day. Dismissing all scientific opinion contrary to his own, and angrily refuses to be convinced that he does not occupy a more favourable, exactly what that means depends on whether Chris is looking for pity or adulation at the time, tier of the spectrum. On the spectrum of narcissism perhaps, but not autism, not at this point. Chris on neurotypicality. Chris also has little understanding of the concepts of neurotypicality. The state of lacking any kind of autistic traits. Some people on the autism spectrum, especially those with Asperger's, are deemed to be of above average intelligence or possess a special talent in other fields like music or art. Chris has taken that to mean he himself must alone be, must also be in that same group of autistics, where he is much smarter than the average person. Guys, I'll be completely honest as well, is that once again, there's, you know, intelligence and you know what uh and you know what actually having the foresight to actually do things that are intelligent are very very different animals and you know what just say just having a high iq doesn't mean shit if you don't actually do something intelligent with it this is especially prevalent during the dimensional merge era where he refers to non-believers believers as neurotypically hindered the irony is just, it's almost make it causing my screen to melt. There's too much of it. Chris on autism education. Chris is a firm believer in mainstream education for children with autism, a trait he doubtlessly picked from his parents, who went to incredible lengths to keep him in mainstream classrooms throughout his school years. He had special education classes in addition to his mainstreaming coping skills classes during both middle and high school. When asked for his advice on how to raise an autistic child, Chris replied, most importantly, mainstream. Let your child be free to communicate and associated with the normal society. Special education is okay, but that will not do in the longest run. Later, for advice on how to succeed despite being afflicted with Asperger's, Chris's only response was, my advice is to mainstream the child. During a video from April 2010, Chris read off a lengthy printout of autism-related information. After quoting a passage about how the education of autistic children should be undertaken by trained professionals in specialised settings, Chris offered his own opinion. Did anybody ask for it? No, but he's going to give it anyway. As for me though, I highly recommend mainstreaming them. Let him go through normal life. I mean, yeah, you got the special treatment while they're young, but when you get him in elementary or middle school or high school, mainstream is the way to go. 
In short, Chris believes that the approach and that produced the man as we know today, i.e. ignoring the problem and doing nothing to help it, is the best possible way to raise and educate children with autism. Now, I do... Um, one or two things I actually do have to point into this as well is that um, when I was going through, and especially more during my high school years, so... I, okay, here's the thing, is that I remember that... Um, myself and a friend of mine, when I was about 12 years old, we did actually get, um, a certain level of, like, time out from regular classes to actually have, like, I don't necessarily want to say, like, special education classes, but they were sort of ways in which we could actually talk and sort of, like, co come to terms with certain things that perhaps we had difficulties with and difficulties in terms of, like, trying to settle in and like main and and be in school and stuff like that it's just the sort of things that were actually devised specifically so that um people that there, there could be a degree of nurturing and sort of um getting people to like associate in schools by degrees but one thing you also gonna have to understand is that this was before may of 2010 and then as soon as David Cameron and the Conservatives came into power along, well, a coalition government with the uh, Liberal Democrats, is that basically they gutted almost all of these services. And whether I liked it or not, for the most part, I was sort of uh, on my own or rather just put into a field, well, rather just put into the field of because my situation was less severe than other people. Or in fact, I don't. The only real, um, like, uh, resources that were available were those in very extreme cases. And let me tell you something. There were plenty of people who actually were in school, in school from when I was still in education, at least to 10 years ago, who had very extreme issues and uh, they needed just... A very different approach to uh, being educated to what we know today and the things about this as well is the fact that I actually got on really really well with those guys and I'm I'm bringing these things into light ladies and gentlemen because it would be extremely um easy just for me to say well based on my own experience these sorts of things happened but one thing I also want to like bring up into this is the fact that just because my just because Chris's experience was different and my experience was different, it doesn't mean to say that it's the right option because I've had various people try and tell me oh these last couple of years is that school let me down in some regards because of this, and no doubt it's probably let a lot of people down now whether you want to say that's down to the school or whether or not the way schools were run. Bear in mind, the education secretary, well, uh, for a large part of my time in secondary school was a man called Michael Gove, who is one of the most limpest, most pathetic attempts at someone trying to take politics seriously. And yeah, if, if you know anything about like British politics and throughout these for at least the last 20 years, I will say, well, take my advice and say that it it doesn't it's it doesn't it doesn't look good is what i'm trying to get across but i suppose as well for the fact and and bear in mind i have my parents well specifically my my dad he worked in education for 40 years he's forgotten more than probably i'll ever know and it also and, and and again i'm very very uh much the wrong person to go to when it comes to like how do you um, educate people with uh, special uh, who require extra attention? But even I feel like I would be a little bit more qualified to know what's going on or how things should be run in comparison to Chris and what he thinks. Because again, it stands to the question, why should you take advice from someone on how to run a school if you've never actually worked in one? Yeah. Autism cured? Chris's greatest dream is that his autism might one day be cured, although in 2006 he would have unhesitantly sacrificed such a cure in order to obtain a PlayStation 3. I wish that he was joking, but he wasn't. 
There are instances of children explicitly recovering from the symptoms, but there is no known cure for autism that can simply be applied to everyone like Chris's vaccine. Imagine the surprise of the mental health community then when Chris revealed in March 2009 that he had overcome his autism once and for all. So, yeah, um, I'm not going to blame it on my autism. I have realised I am over that now. Over what? Over your autism? Yes. Anyway, what is it you want to do now? Christian, are you serious? Autism is not influenza. You don't get over it. I've broken out of my autistic show and I'm able to socialise better in public with past practices online. Until the, until and he, Chris was adamant very much up to the moment when he wouldn't. Chris claimed during the same chat that he may not be making sense uh, due to a virus, easily allowing for him to retract this. Fortunately, Chris has discovered that stress is a more socially popular scapegoat for his personal shortcomings. Of course, people learn to manage stress, but what do you expect? Everything is an issue to Chris that isn't, you know, directly responsible. He isn't directly responsible for. As of May 2009, Chris seemed to have regained his autism and was back to blaming it for his problems, seemingly believing that autism is as easy to shake, regain as the common flu. However, in November of 2009, saw Chris again claiming to be have been miraculously cured, as stated at the end of part two of his Sonichu PowerPoint presentations where he described himself as a high-functioning autistic recovered. A month later, Chris again backpedaled. In response to Edie's claim that he was suffering from autism, he agreed, I am still... I still am for real. Chris's flip-flopping self-diagnosis simply illustrates his misunderstanding of his problems. Since autism is his scapegoat for when he fucks up, to him, that's really all it is. A disease that makes people fuck up all the time. Therefore, when he fails, he has a bad case of autism. And when everything is going well, such as when he believes he has a girlfriend, he thinks the autism has gone away. What Chris really wants then is not a cure for autism, but a life in which nothing happens that he would need to blame on his autism. That is, a life in which he has a girlfriend and nobody criticises him. In June of 2016, he claimed to have cured his autism using subliminal frequency hypnosis. Yes, he did again, and this is when Chris was a massive, massive dick. Like, from saying that he would prefer, you know, his uh, sweetheart not to have autism so that his kids wouldn't have autism, as if that's all that matters when becoming a parent is what your child may or may not have. And also the thing he said about uh, about men possibly having a vagina under their wo un under their uter under their their taint, and I don't want to go over it again because again it's extremely ex extremely graphic, disturbing, and it's it's once again it's I'm I'm tearing up, ladies and gentlemen, because I cannot believe once again Chris could be so horrible to say the things that he said. I can't, I can't, I can't even talk about it without getting, like, seriously upset about it. He stated that the track made him think clearer and interact better with others. However, he has shown no improvement in the quality of his recent videos, and he would continue to make autism-related content in the future. Things Chris has not blamed on his autism. Is it bad for me to say, ladies and gentlemen, that you know what? Even the most severely affected uh, people with autism as well take far more responsibility for, for, the, for things that they are actually responsible for. And you know what? I'll just say this once again um, when it comes to autism, uh, something that comes to autism. It might be something completely unrelated, but I think it, I, it's worth pulling in. Is that... Um, Four and a half years ago, I was on the metro heading to heading to work. So this would have been uh, early December of 2019, and there was this 16-year-old uh, black kid uh, who I think had it was definitely had like a one a very extreme case of autism, and 
he had like glasses and he had sort of like clothes pegs uh, all over his head and he was uh, all over his hair and I think he was like trying to resemble a unicorn and he had to have at least three uh, full grown women with him with uh, like a harness like uh, well with reins all over his body as if he was going to run away from anybody if literally they lost sight of if they took their eyes off him for one moment. But the thing was as well is that this kid and he was he had like a high school uniform on and everything is that he looked incredibly like happy and contented and whether he might have been fully aware of anything as well. But you know what? I think what was more important that he was he looked happy and it was I, I and again the, the, the thing I want to relate with the, the, the relevancy of that story for what they are worth ladies and gentlemen is that do you think he asked for this? Do you think that is, do you think for one minute that was what he, he wanted in life? But then again, maybe he's just sort of perfectly fine with, 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 with well, so, in, well, then again, it might be so completely out of his control that it might not make a difference either way. But you know what? Why would you want to, again, he was just, he seemed like this really sweet and innocent kid. And... You know what? Why would anybody want harm to come his way? Because you know fine well that obviously, you know, it's things seem to be a little bit beyond his control. But, well, so what? That's just... It wasn't, it wasn't his fault. Again, he didn't ask for any of this to happen. He didn't seem to know quite much about what was going on either. But he was smiling uh, and with, with, with perfect teeth as well, it must be said. And, well... That it, it, he wasn't causing harm to anyone. He was just a load to his own devices. But I can tell you, even that kid, if he did something wrong, would rather sooner apologize and make amends more than probably Chris could. Chris and other autistics. Listening to Chris go on about us true and honest autistics, you might think he has some kind of misplaced sense of autistic solidarity. But this would be merely be dumb. And Chris Chan always shoots from both dumb and repugnant. So the reality is that he doesn't give a shit about anyone's autism but his own. He calls lower functioning autistics windows into hell and regards them with exactly the same kind of fear and mistrust he bitches about people treating with him. When in reality, many much lower functional autistics lead far more independent and fulfilling lives than he does. He has once expressed a disdain for others with high functioning autism, with HFA being one of the characteristics excluding a woman from being a potential sweetheart. Meanwhile, he looks at people with Asperger's syndrome, who are all roughly the same part on the spectrum as him, as dirty whores trying to somewhere steal the limelight from real autistics. Ironically, many feel this way about Chris. Go figure. Chris has only once included another autistic person in his comics. In emails with Sarah Jackson, she told Chris that her sister was also a high-functioning autistic. When Sarah was included in episode 19, so was her sister Rita. When Rita was given dialogue after Sarah's death, what she said made so little sense grammatically, even by Chris's standards, that it is hard to see it is as unintentional. It can therefore be speculated that Chris, thinking his own autism so much better than anyone else's, was attempting to make Rita seem as unintelligent as he assumes other autistics and the people with mental disorders actually are. His stance on autistic people would seem to shift a little, however, in 2011, with him further believing himself to be a spokesperson for autism, whether anybody asked him to or not. Chris had attempted to educate people about autistic people in his Little Big Planet 2 series, The Autism Tutorial. The second part of the series had Chris decreeing that all autistic people should man and woman up as respectively. In order to socialise with other people, in the extra part of the series, Chris slapped his representation of Hans Asperger out of the belief that he selfishly put his ill name in association with the disorder. Remember the fact that Chris 
names an entire city out of himself, but what can you do? Chris has also claimed that his longtime friend Anna McLaren is autistic. Other autistics and Chris. It should be noted that not all autistics are like Chris. I hope that if there's anything, any one thing to take away from any of this, it should be this one right here. Every person's experience with autism is different and very autistic, every autistic person I should say, has a different combination of symptoms, social skills, sensory issues, empathy, special interests, routines, repetitive and restrictive behaviours, and more. A common analogy for this is that an autistic brain is a melting pot or soup of symptoms and behaviours. One person's soup might be a little bit salty but still good, as they might show a few symptoms but still live a happy life. Another person's soup may taste horrible without seasoning, as they might need some support to function day to day. It just so happens that Chris's soup is a disgusting mix mixture of sewage, Fanta, rotten eggs and comeuppance, as he has an extremely unfortunate combination of symptoms and behaviours. Autism Deferred Disposition, main article, The Jail Saga. And the court finds by clear and convincing evidence that the criminal conduct was caused by or had a direct and substantial relationship to the person's disorder or disability. Excerpt from uh, C19.2-303.6. In August of 2021, Chris was arrested for the charge of incest on his mother. During the court proceedings, his court-appointed lawyer, David Heilberg, filed on 5th of August 2022 for SS 19.2-303.6, deferred disposition based on what Chris having autism, which the court granted. Really? That's, that's actually a little bit more news to me. Because I always thought the idea was is that Chris... Um, that the court decided that there was no overwhelming substantiated evidence that anything had actually happened to Bob, but there might be a little bit more to it than that. In effect, the law provides that if the court would be justified in a finding of guilt, and that autism had a direct cause in Chris's actions in being a motherfucker, that any further proceedings could be insisted to instead be deferred and Chris being put on probationary terms. If Chris, Chris completes probation, the incest charge would be dismissed. If he fails, the original proceedings continue to a formal verdict of guilt and sentencing. So it's a little bit similar to um, when it comes to things like the... Uh, like, even Daniel Larson's sentencing, but that's a different matter. And for the most part, ladies and gentlemen, that is sort of where we finish, ladies and gentlemen. But we are not quite done yet, because... Good night. There are some other things as well I feel like I need to sort of, like, discuss. Because I want to sort of, like, cover everything else that revolves around this, especially when it comes to Chris and autism. Because... <coughs> <coughs> Outside of things like psychology, which I think we have done before, and things like mental health care and stuff like that, there's a lot of things as well we need to go into further detail from Chris's views to Asperger's syndrome, Asperger's itself, um, the autism tutorial, and his, def his defectment and how he treats other people who are severely less fortunate than even Chris himself. But... Hopefully, we've given something of a bit more of a um, a really unique sort of like uh, showcasing of Chris's um, identity, or rather the way he relates to autism. Because unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, and this is going to be a, it, it would be more interesting if it wasn't for the fact that again, it's about de it's about dedicating time to someone who. At, ho at bottom probably doesn't deserve it because um, I know Chris likes to believe in some way that his autism is the root cause of all of his problems. I, however, see this as the fact that, well, even by Chris's standards, and listen, I'm, I'm 26, ladies and gentlemen, and I've known fine well that 
for many, many years that... Because I've never really, or have pretty much never blamed my... Or, I didn't really f find out, actually, to be honest, that I had Asperger's until I was at least 15. I sort of knew I was, like, quite different anyway. But then again, I just thought... I attributed it just... Um, being a happy, a smiling child when I was younger to feelings of confliction and eventual acceptance when I was a teenager. And, well, when it came out in 2015, well, when I found out properly in 2015, well, no, no, not 2015, when I found out when I was 15, so this would have been 2013, I just sort of um, just accepted it for what it was and continued to go about as I was. It seems like, you know what the, the other big tragedy is as well that comes from this is the idea that really there should have been no reason why Chris's life needed to spiral this far out of control. Whether or not Chris likes it or not, he is responsible for his actions. All of them. And you know what? If you want to say Chris's autism is really as but is as bad outside of you know other things that can be attributed to um, Chris's personality, to how he views other people, to how he views himself, how his entitlement and everything that comes out through trolling or the way that he addresses his family or everything else for that matter. I think it's fair to say that you know what. It, that's it's it's sort of what Chris is a part of, but the the idea that literally like he he thinks that you know his babysitter caused uh, Chris's autism to happen, or that Chris like it. I think the only way I can like uh, summarize this 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 whole video properly is that well, you know what there are people that are severely you know less fortunate than Chris. There are people that actually make perfect you who make use of what they have and they actually get through in spite of what they have or some people thinking that they're not normal. But through what Chris is, because any other person in, in the scenario from at least following the issues with Blue Spike would have made reparations to find out how they can change their behaviors and sort of find out whether they can make their lives any better. But because Chris's priorities are mainly selfish and only really concern himself for what he wants, it's a little bit past... It almost... It's like as though his ego is his major diagnosis. His narcissism is his real disease. Autism is just something that he has so that he can use it when and how he wants, which is not really how it works and something that shouldn't be encouraged. And something that has probably been proven with uh, all the videos I've done about Chris is that he doesn't really seem to be able to distinguish the unfortunate implications out of what he does with it. And with all that being said and done, I hope all of you guys have enjoyed this much longer video than I originally ever anticipated about uh, Chris Chan and his autism. And I can await all of you guys again in the next video. Take care and... Bye-bye for now.